Greetings, Spooky fans! Michael here, and earlier this year, I made a video telling you all the saga of the first Nuzlocke I ever attempted, which was actually a Let's Play series here on my channel. A quick summary of everything that happened is that it was awful. The idea behind that video format was to give you all the story of a big event here on my channel in a much more condensed format than a 30 or 40 episode Let's Play. Since you all seem to really like that Platinum Nuzlocke video, I'm here to do another video about another playthrough that I did. My Pokemon Moon Wonderlock. And yes, it was another Nuzlocke. I did another one despite not liking the first one and actually did several more after that. I, ju I just, I, they got more views, okay? But what is a Wonderlock? Well, first and foremost, it is a Pokemon Nuzlocke and has the three primary Nuzlocke rules. If a Pokemon faints, it is dead and cannot be used anymore. You can only catch the first Pokemon you encounter in any given location. And if you lose a single battle, you lose the Nuzlocke and your playthrough is over. The wonder part of the name comes from the main gimmick of this type of Nuzlocke. Every Pokemon you obtain must be wonder traded before you can ever use it in battle, if possible. For those unaware, wonder trading, now called surprise trading in Sword and Shield, is a random trade with a random person, and you have no control over what you get. It's an interesting concept because you could get a really buff breed ject or complete garbage. Doing this type of Nuzlocke also removes one of the most common Nuzlocke rules, that you have to nickname all of your Pokemon. Prior to Sword and Shield, there was no possible way to change the nickname for a traded Pokemon. So in this one, I literally cannot nickname my Pokemon. There's also another common Nuzlocke rule that I removed for this playthrough, the dupes clause. If you happen to encounter a Pokemon that is in the same evolutionary line as one that you have already caught, then you're allowed to skip it and find something different. I decided not to have that for this, just to make it more interesting. So if I got five Wingulls, I was stuck with five Wingulls. If you want to watch the original playthrough in its entirety, it is still up here on the channel and you can find the link to the playlist up in the cards and in the description below. But if you're down for this more condensed story with more in retrospective ideas and jokes and stuff, then don't forget to subscribe to my channel since less than half of my viewers are subscribed. And let's dive into the saga of my Pokemon Moon Wonderlock. I did this playthrough not long after Sun and Moon came out in late 2016. Once I finished my regular playthrough of Sun, since I was not making my first playthrough of a new Pokemon game a Nuzlocke, I don't hate myself. I named myself, mmm, spicy, so I could have moments like these. That's right, it does, mmm, spicy. <laughs> and then it took 45 minutes before I could do any wonder trading. So many freaking cutscenes, and then I had to go through the Festival Plaza tutorial. It was ugh. And then once I finally could, I had trouble getting a strong enough internet signal in my bedroom, hence why I'm holding the 3DS out behind me. I finally did get to wonder trade my starter and the two other encounters I got when playing normally and got an Alolan Rattata, a Magnemite, and an Abra. Not a great first session. In the next episode, I was able to get a slow poke, then progressed through the trainer school without a hitch, mainly using Magnemite. My next wonder trade was a Poplio with a timid nature, which I was very excited about. My next trade was a Machop named Macholo, which is its German name, then an entire Gumshoes. The Gumshoes was level 28 though, which meant I couldn't use it. This actually caused me to have a disturbing realization. Like a teacher holding a class over Zoom, I was going to have problems with others listening to me. Any Pokemon I received that was higher than my current in-game obedience level was useless because it would not obey me. So this Gumshoes, not any good until I got to a higher obedience level. Additionally, I had to be careful about how much I leveled up the Pokemon that would listen to me because if they surpassed that level, they would become equally useless. And that is deceptively tricky because all traded Pokemon gain boosted experience. At this early point, I had to make sure my Pokemon didn't grow past level 20 before I defeated Hala, at which point I'd be good until level 35. But that's easier said than done. 
so I had to be careful. I continued on to the first trial, which was over in one turn thanks to Macholo. Then my next wonder trade encounters were a Pikapek, a Shellos and a Beast Ball, another Abra, and a Rowlet, which was the most exciting of the bunch. Looking back on this playthrough, I was and still am pleasantly surprised at the variety of Pokemon I got from wonder trading. I was expecting most of them to be like early Route 1 garbage Pokemon like Young Goose or Wingull, but it actually took a little bit of time before I even got my first repeat, the Abra. Not long later, Poplio evolved, now making it definitely the strongest member of my team for the time being. Then was the battle with Hala, or as I like to say, Hala at your girl. Brian took out his Mankey and Makuhita with little issue, but then there was a very close call with Crabrawler's Z-Move. The Alola games can be tricky to Nuzlocke. You've got the Totem Trials, which is two versus one, one of the enemy Pokemon having boosted stats, and then you've got the Grand Trials and later Elite Four, where they have freaking Z moves, incredibly powerful moves that could KO and kill a Pokemon that normally would not fall to any regularly powered move. Plus, some of the boss battles are just tough even if they don't use Z-moves. Thankfully, Brian survived the Z-move and was able to finish its sweep and win us the battle, making it so obedience would not be a worry for quite some time. My next wonder trades were a sand dial named Samuel and then another sand dial literally immediately afterward. The first one had a fun nickname, so that was nice, but it was level 30, which would obey me, but I didn't want to use it because I felt it would be unfair and would make the videos less interesting. The second had its Japanese name, which is romanized to Meguroko. It was level one, had an adamant nature, and had the egg moves Thunder and Fire Fang. I was absolutely using the Japanese one. Once on Akala Island, my next wonder trade was another Magnemite, and then a while later, a freaking Alolan Marowak, which was super exciting, and then super not. It's level 53, gosh dang it. And then right before the water trial, I got my third damn Abra. Abra, Abra, Abra goddamn. But then right after that, I got an adamant stuffle in a love ball named Velersi. It's German name, which I found wildly fun to say, and still do to this day. Balersi. After swapping it in for Macholo due to its better nature and awesome coverage moves of Ice Punch, Thunder Punch, and Stomping Tantrum, it was time for the Water Trial. Magnemite paralyzed the Wishy Washy right away, then got soaked, turning into a water type. After not much happening, including not a single turn of the totem being fully paralyzed, I brought in Dartrix, which KO'd the partner wishy-washy, resulting in Alomomola being brought in. Giant mistake. Alomomola could both heal the totem wishy-washy's HP and got rid of its paralysis. After Dartrix had been growled too much, I swapped it back out for Magnemite, who successfully took down the Alomomola. It was a self-sacrifice though, since Wishy Washy immediately killed it with a water gun, giving me my first death of the playthrough. When I brought Magnemite back in, I had remembered that it only took about 20 HP damage from Wishy Washy's water gun beforehand, so I thought it was safe from being KO'd. However, I forgot that when I switched it out and switched it back in, it lost its water typing that it got from Soak, so it no longer resisted the hit. I made a mistake and Magnemite paid the price. It was a valiant sacrifice though, taking down the Aloma Mola. And for that, we salute our fallen comrade. Dartrix came back in and finished off the battle, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. After the battle to honor my fallen Magnemite, I replaced it with the other one. This one was Spanish. It was a Magnemite. I then got a snow runt, and then after catching an exceedingly frustrating to catch Magmi, I attempted to give it a vengeful nickname. I suck balls. There you go, okay? You get a Magmi and a Wonder Trade named I suck balls. It's this stupid thing. Can't enter that word, balls? I suck poop. I traded it for a Trumbeak, which I added to the party right away to level up in preparation for the Lorantis trial. 
benching Brian until that trial was over. The fire trial was easy as Mega Roko the Sand Dial okoed the totem Salazzle with Sand Tomb. I then got several more encounters thanks to Lapras Surfing, which I traded for a Gibble, a Cutie Fly, a Grubbin, and a Wingull. A little while later, there were several evolutions. Sand Dial into Crocorock, Trumbeak into Two Cannon, and Velarsi into Beware. That last one resulted in something terrible though. It lost the name Velarsi. Turns out if you have a Pokemon with a foreign species name, but evolve it in a your language game, its name changes to just the your language evolution species name. So Velarsi did not turn into its German Beware species name, a similarly fun to say name, Kostorso. It just turned into Beware. I was very disappointed by this, so I resolved to continue calling it Valerci. The Laurentis trial was no problem. Thanks to my preparations with getting Beak Blast onto Cannon, meaning I hella over leveled. You know me, I don't like tough battles. The trial was over in just three turns. My next two trades were an Alolan Rattata and a Wingull, so those were lame. Can I just say that Wingull never bothered me as a Pokemon until the Alola games? They are everywhere in the frickin' Alola region. It's so annoying and they confuse you with Supersonic, ugh. Not long before Olivia's battle, Magnemite evolved into just a Magneton. I then got to do several more traits that got me a Young Goose, a repeat Poplio, and my fourth frickin' Abra. I was starting to regret not implementing the dupes clause, but at least I wasn't having many deaths. Combined playing through a mostly not too hard game, the fact that my Pokemon got boosted experience and my excessive amounts of preparation due to a deeply seated inability to accept failure or loss of any kind. And you have me doing well at the Nuzlocke. Next was the battle with Olivia. Crocorock took out Nosepass and Boldor, getting Moxie boosts from both, then tanked a Continental Crush before finishing off Lycanroc, completing its sweep. May I just interject that I love the Crocodile line, but a big reason I do is because of all the positive experiences I've had with it by sweeping with Moxie. Moxie is just such an awesome ability. It might be my favorite. My next trades were for a Wimpod and a Spearow. Then not long after arriving on Ula Ula Island, my starters evolved. Dartrix into Decidueye and Breon into Primarina. Kind of funny that the starter I picked and traded away was a Litten, yet I ended up with the other two on my team. The journey from Mali City to Mount Hakulani brought many encounters, allowing me to get several new trades, including Alolan Grimer, Skarmory, Mimikyu, and Goldeen. So close to all four being good. It was one less trade than I could have had though, because one of my wild encounters was a Minior that was incredibly rude and blew itself up. After evolving my Alakazam with some trading help, it was time for the Vikavolt trial. My attempt to Oko it with the Rock Z move barely failed, but since Valarsi was faster than Vikavolt, it just had to finish it off the next turn, then charge a bug a few turns later. Overall, an easy trial. On the way to the next trial, immediately after a nightmarish Elekid capture battle, what is it with these two? Crocorock evolved into Crocodile. I then was able to do several trades, getting an Execute, a repeat Snowrunt, a Rock Ruff, and a repeat Gibble. Then it was time for the Mimikyu trial. After breaking its disguise, Magneton obliterated it with a corkscrew crash. Then I just had to bring in Valerci to finish off the Haunter. Another trial with no issues. Z moves are, God, they're just, they're so bad. They make so many of these totem trials comically easy, but then they also make Nuzlocks against the elite four members or grand trials brutal at times. Then they make competitive a mess. I just, I, I just, I don't miss them. Several more trades after that trial got me a repeat Skarmory with its French name of Amure, a third Magnemite, this one called Magnetilo, a Fletchling, a Fero, a Litten, I finally had all three, a Comfey, and another Rowlet. The next event of note was the double battle outside Po Town, where I was very dumb. Instead of ensuring Alakazam took out the Haunter first, I took out the Drowsy, expecting Primarina to take out the Haunter before it could move. 
I forgot how fast Haunter was and how slow Primarina was though. So after Alakazam took out the Drowsy, the Haunter killed an already damaged Alakazam with Shadow Ball. I mean, it wasn't great that that happened, but of all the party members, Alakazam is probably the one that I was least attached to, considering I had just gotten so many freaking Abras and I wasn't using it much in battle to the point where I was actually considering replacing it. It still stung to lose it though, mostly because I felt dumb. I replaced Alakazam not with another Alakazam, but with the jolly Italian Fletchling. It is a happy Fletchling, eh? since I wanted its type coverage more. I then battled my way through Team Skull's stronghold while Fletchling, now Fletchender, was leveling up in the background. Then I got another Litten from trading. Then during an off-camera grinding session, I evolved the Fletchender into Talonflame. By the way, if you're wondering why my face cam background is different from this episode and then for the rest of the video, that's because like with my Platinum Nuzlocke, the first chunk of the series I recorded at home and then I moved back into my dorm room and filmed the rest of the series. With the Platinum Nuzlocke, it was filming over summer break, then the fall semester, but this Moon Wonderlock was over winter break, then the spring semester. Next was the Grand Trial against Nanu. While Primarina took out Sableye easily, Krokorok posed more problems due to causing confusion and Earthquake doing a lot more damage. But where came in and handled it though, then Primarina came back in to defeat Alolan Persian, which oddly never used its Z-move. Three of the four Grand Trials done. And then nothing happened for a long time. Seriously, it was an episode and a half of just battling through Aether Paradise. No deaths, no trades, no encounters, nothing. Even the final battle with Guzma was pretty freaking easy. If I was making this series today, I would have trimmed out most of it. In fact, I would have trimmed out just a lot of this series to be perfectly honest. Finally, I reached the first battle with Lusamine and I O-code all five of her Pokemon. Due to the nature of my entire team being traded Pokemon and therefore getting the boosted experience and ending up over leveled, even during the periods when I turned off the experience share, a lot of the battles ended up not being very exciting, which was fine for me, but I was getting some viewers that were annoyed by it. So around this point, I started to make it so I was over leveled less, which, made things less fun for me. Finally on Pony Island, I got to my first trades in a while, getting me a Spinarak, a Magikarp, a third Gibble, and an Oracorio named Sweet D. Nothing interesting, but at least Sweet D is a fun name. Then it was time for the grand trial against Hapu, but due to what I had just mentioned about viewers wanting me to not be so over leveled, I had left the experience share off for a while resulting in my team being close to her levels rather than above. She led with Alolan Dugtrio, which made me switch out Decidueye for Valersi, who handled it after tanking an earthquake. Then she brought in Mudsdale and I brought in Primarina. Sparkling Aria barely didn't KO though, allowing Mudsdale to fire back with Tectonic Rage, which one shot Primarina and killed it. This one, hurt the most of the deaths so far. Primarina had been on the team since basically the entire time. I used it in the very first grand trial and I think I got it before the first trial. I was reasonably attached to this Primarina and the fact that I lost it just because my attack barely didn't Oko, just, God, I hate Nuzlocks. Also, I now had to finish the battle against the ground type trainer without a water type. I brought in Decidueye as she healed Mudsdale. Unfortunately, Decidueye did far less damage to Mudsdale thanks to its naturally high defense and the stamina boosts. The next hit was a crit though, which was able to finish it off. In came Flygon and I brought in Valersi since it has ice punch. I had to heal though, which allowed Flygon to get off an earth power, which did just a bit less than half, meaning a better damage roll or crit would kill Valersi. I risked it though, and Valersi clutch survived the earth power, firing back with ice punch. Finally was Gastrodon, which was easy for Decidueye to beat. After the battle, I replaced Primarina with Comfey, since I felt the fairy typing was more valuable than water. 
I could have grinded up the repeat Poplio, but I decided not to for a couple reasons. The first was that I felt I should have more variety on my team. I'd already replaced one dead Pokemon with another Pokemon of the same species, and I didn't feel like I should do that again. The second reason is that Comfey was much higher level than the Poplio, so it was a lot less work to catch it up to the rest of the team. And then the third reason was that I cared about the fairy type coverage more than the water type coverage. I don't remember why, I just say that in the video at some point. Looking back on it though, I could have used the Mimikyu that I got. Mimikyu being a very, very good Pokemon. And I don't know why I didn't. Maybe it was because I was worried about the ghost type overlapping with Decidueye. And you know, there's like Acerola's ghost type. I don't know, I feel like I should have just used the Mimikyu though. It was three years ago, okay? You can't expect me to be perfect or remember why I did everything. Once in Vast Pony Canyon, I was finally able to evolve Magneton into Magnezone. After battling through the rest of the canyon with no issues, I took on the Kamo O trial. I tried to Oko it with Twinkle Tackle, but it protected itself, making the fairy Z move, and the only Z move I had, do less than half. In came the Scizor, but I kept Kumfei in to Dazzling Gleam and finish off the Kamo O. Kumfei tanked a Metal Claw, which I was surprised by, but then later realized was possible because the Scizor was almost 20 levels lower than Kumfei. All I then had to do was switch it out for Talonflame to finish off the Scizor, taking down the final totem Pokemon. After some story stuff, it was time to finally battle Demon Jellyfish Lusamine. Her Clefable proved extremely difficult to KO thanks to its aura, cosmic power, and repeatedly healing with moonlight. After eight turns and some necessary flash cannon special defense drops, I finally took it down. Lusamine's Clefable in this specific battle, the one that's only in Sun and Moon with the auras and the demon jellyfish stuff, is probably the most annoying major boss battle Pokemon to defeat in just all of the games. Maybe there's another one that's worse than I'm remembering, but it is it is so annoying. Not difficult, because you're rarely gonna be in danger of it, like sweeping your team. It's just so freaking bulky and has the aura that boosts its special defense and it uses cosmic power and it keeps healing with moonlight. You basically have to stall out all of its moonlight PP, which I did do in this battle. It took eight turns. After the Clefable, she sent in Beware and my Comfey took it down with two hits. I then O-Code her Lilligant with Talonflame and her Magius with Crocodile. And then after a few recovers, I was able to take down her Milotic with a Crit Oko Leaf Blade from Decidueye. Lusamine was done. After it looked like she died, but she didn't, I Master Balled Lunala as to not let it kill anything. I couldn't bring myself to Wonder Trade the Lunala though, because I was playing this on a legit cartridge. It was a legitimate Lunala, I didn't just wanna get rid of it. This is completely allowed in the rules though, because if I don't wonder trade it, I don't get to use it. So I basically intentionally skipped out on a wonder trade encounter. So it didn't benefit me at all by just tossing it in the box and never using it. Then at Mount Lanakila, I defeated Gladion with a couple close calls, but nothing too severe. Then after climbing Mount Lanakila, I had my final battle with Howe. First, Decidueye O-Code Raichu. In came Howe's Decidueye, and I brought in Valarcy to use the Ice Z move on Decidueye. Now you may be wondering why I brought in Valarcy against the Decidueye instead of one of my other team members that had stab super effective damage, like Talonflame or Crocodile. Well, Talonflame I was scared to use because Decidueye had Smackdown. So if I didn't Oko it, Talonflame was dead. Then Crocodile, is weak to grass. So if I didn't Oko it, Crocodile was dead. Valerci had super effective damage with Ice Punch and like wasn't weak to any of Decidueye's moves. It was actually immune to the ghost moves. Valerci fires off the Sub-Zero Slammer and it leaves Decidueye with what has to have been literally one HP. Look how little red is left. You can barely see it, it's ridiculous. Why am I so mad about this? Because How's Decidueye immediately fired back with its own Z move, Bloom Doom. If this kills, I'm going to be livid. I can't. 
cannot believe that. This is the second Nuzlocke where the last rival battle before the League kills one of my Pokémon because they barely survive. Oh, I am so pissed off right now. And I still am! Well, I'm not most of the time. I'm not just walking around angry every day thinking about this, but talking about it has made me relive those negative emotions, which were pretty intense. Like, not only had I lost a beloved team member, Balarsi, but also losing a Pokemon in the last battle right before the league is like the worst time to lose one. And it was my second time having it happen. Why is it the worst time? Because I now have to replace a team member with something else that I'm gonna have to grind up on exclusively wild Pokemon because I've already beaten all the trainers in the game because it's right before the freaking league. It's arguably better to just lose one in the league because then you're like, welp, I mean, it's just gone now, but at this point in time, I feel an obligation to replace it. Some extra context is that this is happening my senior year of college, which was an annoyingly very busy year for me due to schoolwork and YouTube work. So I'm sitting here having just witnessed this loss, upset about Velursi being dead, but also realize I now have to spend a heck of a lot more time grinding something up while I'm already stressed and swamped with schoolwork. This death was not just an emotional loss, it was a time loss and a stress gain. After Magnezone finished off Decidueye, Talonflame had to deal with Komala since Velursi was dead and it was a close call requiring multiple healing items. Then Magnezone beat Vaporeon relatively easily thanks to Hydro Pump missing, winning me the battle. I had won, but I was still furious. I then did my final wonder trades of the game with the Pokemon I caught on the climb up the mountain. It got me a star you, so nothing exciting. It was then time to grind and stress about all the preparation and figuring out strategies for all of the battles and do my mountains of schoolwork. Just, oh, that sucked. Velarsi's replacement was Ermiore the Skarmory. The choice may seem weird since it has two types already covered on the team, but I wanted it because Steel and Flying are both helpful against the Elite Four. Additionally, I wanted something to tank hits from Kakui Snorlax, a Pokemon I was really afraid of. Also, my team was not overleveled for the league because my viewers wanted more excitement and more pain. First was the Hala battle. Immediately, there was trouble. Since Hariyama tanked Kumfei's Dazzling Gleams, then almost KO'd it with close combat. Kumfei was eventually able to get the KO though. Then it was time for Crabominable and I sent out Magnezone. My plan was to bait him into using the fighting type Z move, then switch to Decidueye. But instead he just went for close combat. Once Decidueye was in, I had to switch to Skarmory, who took a ton of damage from Ice Hammer, far more than I was expecting. I healed and it used close combat, which also did a ton. Skarmory was not turning out to be the defensive tank that I thought it would be. I healed one more time, expecting another close combat to drop its defenses even further, but then this ugly, stupid beast from hell finally decided to use its Z-move, which knocked out Skarmory in one hit. I spent hours, hours grinding up this stupid Skarmory while I was busy as hell with schoolwork, and then I bring it into battle, and the stupid tin chicken dies before even getting a hit off? Are you kidding me? I brought in Talonflame, who sadly could not Oko it with acrobatics. Then Crabominable's Ice Hammer would have Oko'd Talonflame, but it survived with one HP due to affection. Can you freaking believe this? Why is the ugliest Pokemon in all of Pokemon so freaking powerful? It killed and then almost killed two of my flying types in the fighting type battle. Just, just what the fuck? A couple full restores and acrobatics later, I finally took down the cursed Crabominable. Decidueye hit Polyrath, then tanked a hit, and then on the second turn, instead of KOing, I healed up Kumfei. 
Polyrath's next waterfall, of course, was a critical hint, but it was fine since I knew Decidueye had enough to live it, which is why I took the turn to heal Comfey. I then brought in Comfey against Primeape. Comfey tanked a cross chop, then did big damage with Dazzling Gleam. For some reason, I think to save PP, I opted for Grass Knot next, which did not KO. After healing and having to tank two more cross chops, Comfey took it down. In came Beware and I had to heal again. Dazzling Gleam could not Oko, but it did a lot and Hammer Arm didn't do much. Comfey was able to take it down, winning me the battle. Ugh, that Hala battle required, I wanna say eight potions, maybe more. And then multiple times it nearly killed two of my Pokemon and killed a third that I spent hours and hours grinding up in preparation for the league. So yeah, I think my thoughts about that battle are best summed up by something I said during it. Oh my God, I hate everything. Next was the Olivia battle. Relicanth was easily taken down by Decidueye. Crocodile O-Code her Lycan Rock with its own Z move before she could use hers. Something I realized I should have done for the Hollow battle. In came Carbink, which Magnezone O-Code. Crocodile broke Probopass's Sturdy with Crunch, dropping its defense, then finished it with Earthquake. Finally, Decidueye took down Golem with a few moves. It was nice to have an easy battle after that nightmarish Hala battle. Next was the Acerola battle. First, Comfey O-Code Sableye. Then Magnezone O-Code Frostlass. Comfey was faster than Palisand and took it out with two Grass Nuts before it could use its Z-Move. Decidueye O-Code Delmice with the Ghost Z-Move. Finally, Crocodile took out Driftblim without any issues. Next was the battle with Kahili, who led with her own Tin Chicken. It took a few hits to KO due to Sturdy and healing, but Magnezone took it out without taking damage. Mandibuzz took a while to KO due to healing, its bulk, and the fact I was using Crocodile's Rock Slide and Thunder Fang, which didn't have stab, but I was able to take it out, getting the Moxie boost. Crocodile then O-Code to Cannon with the Rock Z move, getting another Moxie boost. After some healing and air slash damage, Crocodile took out Oracorio. I finally swapped it out for Magnezone up against Crobat, and one with one discharge. Weird that the Hollow battle was so difficult, but the other three Elite Four members were really easy to defeat, huh? That's it's weird, right? You know? It's almost as if I turned the experience share back on after the Hollow battle because I was incredibly frustrated and spiteful and no longer cared whether the battles were excited and just wanted to be overleveled. But I, I didn't, that didn't happen. No, so it's just a weird, weird thing. Finally was the Kukui battle. Crocodile O-Code Lycanroc with ease. Magneton O-Code Alolan Ninetales. Then came the dreaded Snorlax, a Pokemon I was deeply terrified of. I brought in Talonflame, actually planning to sacrifice it and do damage before it went down. After it survived two body slams though, I realized I might be able to beat it without it dying. I swapped in Decidueye to absorb a body slam, then used Bloom Doom to make sure I finished the Snorlax off. Next was Braviary, which Magnezone O-Code with Discharge. Then came Primarina, but Discharge only did about half. That allowed it to use Hydro Vortex, which O-Code and killed Magnezone. I lost two members of one evolutionary line in the same Nuzlocke. Decidueye came back in and finished off the Primarina. Finally was Kukui's own Magnezone. Crocodile broke the Sterny, then ended it with Earthquake. I had won the Pokemon Moon Wonderlock. As for my overall thoughts on this playthrough, I wish I had not done it. Don't get me wrong, it helped my channel a decent amount, and most of the playthrough was pretty smooth sailing. I only had three deaths prior to the How battle before the league. It was just, those last few episodes were so incredibly stressful for me, far more stress than I could healthily deal with, especially while at freaking college, that the series just ended with leaving a really bad taste in my mouth. I mean, just look how my face looked after winning. I know a lot of people like intense Nuzlocks, but I just, I can't deal with them very well. Back then I thought I had to do them to get views, but now I'm at a point where I don't feel like I have to do that. So I just relive my pain and small doses, 
in videos like these. Thanks so much for watching and an extra special thanks to my patrons over on Patreon who are helping support my channel independent of the fluctuating nature of the YouTube business. If you wanna help support me in the same way, the link is in the description below. Also, if you wanna check out some more of my fun Pokemon content, I recommend these videos here. All right, that's all I have for now. So till next time, big fans, gotta catch them all.